Hello, I'm Michael Parker, and welcome to Antidote. If you're a regular viewer of the show, you're probably tech smart, street smart, and well-informed. But maybe there's people in your family who are not, and maybe they are on the elderly side. So today's show is all about helping you learn to protect the ones who once protected you. There's a predator class out there. They are vile, they are insidious, and they are aggressive, and they prey upon the weak, the old, the sick, and the lonely. Joining us today to discuss this is Curtis Bailey. He is a elder law attorney and co-director of the Senior Scam Action Associates. Curtis, welcome to Antidote. Hi, Michael. It's a pleasure to join you. Thank you. Thank you for coming on. I have been looking into this issue, and in full disclosure, part of the interest that I had in this subject was this showed up in my extended family where an elderly person was taken advantage of by these people. How did you become involved in this? You know, Michael, so many people get involved because they have a personal experience just like you had with a family member that was scammed. Uh, I come at it from a little different angle in that uh, I regularly work with clients who have been victims of scammers, uh, aggressive telemarketers, even up to uh, family members that are financially abusing a, an elderly loved one. So I come at it from the professional angle of uh, talking to clients and consulting with families and trying to help them through this oftentimes very difficult process. One of the things that strikes me about this is, listen, there's always been scammers, there's always been con artists, but now with this weakening, softening global economy, we've also got people living longer, we've got these new shiny smartphones and devices, we've got social media, it's almost a perfect storm um, awaiting the elderly and allowing them to be preyed upon as never before. Uh, you know, Michael, that, that phrase, perfect storm, uh, popped into my mind just right before you said it, because it absolutely is a perfect storm. We have people living longer. We have people that are very fearful of running out of money. We also have a generation, frankly, the largest intergenerational transfer of wealth occurring right now between the baby boomers down to Generation X, and all of those things uh, really do lend themselves to uh, scammers and fraudsters coming out of the woodwork. The other thing that you mentioned is the impact of technology. The scammers are incredibly tech savvy and they're organized and they network well, believe it or not, between themselves. And so it's it's a, it's a terrible uh, problem that uh, we're going to have to devote some time and resources to 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 figure out how to handle. Well, one of the other things that struck me about this um, when I was doing my research is this role that social media is playing in this. And, you know, the youth and the younger people, they make the jokes about the Nigerian prince or this, that, or the other thing, and they know not to post certain things. But from what I'm reading, the elderly are the fastest growing demographic on social media. And there are some issues with that that uh, I think they're not aware of. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Michael. The uh, the over 65 demographic is the uh, fastest growing demographic joining social media every day. And obviously, folks in that demographic did not grow up with computers, right? So this is uh, a new territory for them. And it's uh, oftentimes uh, curiosity killed the cat kind of territory. Uh, unfortunately, they go in very unwary and find themselves uh, being contacted by people that they believe are their friends. But, you know, uh, who knows who's on the other side of that screen? And the over uh, 65 demographic, uh, we call them the gentleman or gentlewoman's generation. They were raised to be polite. They were raised to be helpful. And so they oftentimes struggle with drawing that boundary and particularly in social media where it's very easy to spoof a screen uh, right in front of you. Absolutely. And I see this with, even with my own parents. Um, they, they struggle with things like, and my parents are very smart, but I, they didn't have these types of tools that we have. And my daughters zip around technology and iPads like it's nothing, yet my mother and father struggle with it at times. And so the sad thing here is 
with the social media, oftentimes the elderly, they're wanting to be on social media so that they can be in touch with their family and friends and rekindle relationships and, 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 you know, and fight the loneliness that they may be experiencing. The problem with it is, is they, like you said, they don't know who's on the other side. They could be reaching out or people, bad folks reaching out to them. Then there's the other thing that I've heard you speak about in which when you post photos on social media, sometimes you're not aware of the background information. I mean, maybe there's a license plate, maybe there's a street address in those photos. And these people probably would not even think about that when they're putting those, po those photos up. That's very true. Uh, we always teach uh, every audience that we speak to, to be very uh, cognizant and aware of what it is you're posting. First example, uh, my in-laws are on social media. They're not, uh, you know, they're not dummies either, but they're not uh, also very tech savvy uh, or tech oriented. And what I'm constantly telling them as well as the audiences that we speak to is when you post photographs of your grandchild, okay, it's great to do that. And obviously so many older adults are proud of their grandkids and they post photos and it's a way for them to stay in touch but be very careful about the information that you're adding to those photographs you don't need to say this is my beautiful granddaughter Emily or my handsome grandson Jeff alright because scammers you've just given information to the scammers that they can use and they do use in perpetrating what we call the grandparents scam. Uh, and secondly, I have a perfect story that uh, goes to your first point. Uh, I had a client, a very dear client, whose husband recently passed away, and she joined social media to connect with uh, family and friends and immediately was contacted by an old high school friend, or so she thought. And after a couple minutes of internet chat back and forth on Facebook, the uh, friend proceeded to tell her, hey, I just won $25,000, and guess what? I saw your name on the winner's list. All you need to do is contact uh, a third party, and he'll give you the details. Well, you know, uh, again, my client is not a, a stupid person, but uh, who wouldn't want to uh, win $25,000, right? So she, uh, she contacted the third person, and only when that third person started asking for social security number and some of those relevant personal details did she back away and and rightfully terminated the contact so those are the kinds of things that we're seeing with social media is number one putting too much information out there for the scammers to take advantage of and then also being contacted by what uh, the, the elderly person believes is an old friend and when it in fact is not I want to follow up on that and talk about a couple of these different types of scams. The one you just mentioned, so when this person reached out to your client, were they, did they copy a photo of the person they claimed to be, or did they just send a message without additional information? What, what made her think initially that this person was the person she thought it was? No, you know, it was a completely fabricated profile. It was okay. a completely fake profile, complete with photographs. Uh, it, it had the right high school information, where they both went to high school, had the name, the whole bit. You know, I mean, there, there's obviously a huge underground bartering system for personal information, and, and this kind of uh, data gets transmitted very easily amongst the scammers. And so it's obviously simple to create a fake profile, and so... When my client received the contact, there was nothing, at least initially, that stood out to her to say, well, wait a minute, this, this isn't the person who they say it is. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about a few of these different types of scams. You've already mentioned the grandparent scam. There's the lottery scam. There is this authority figure scam. And there's the fake charities. Give me a little bit of information on each one of those and how they operate. Sure, be happy to. The grandparent scam is probably the uh, the uh, number one scam that we see. Uh, well, I should I, I take that back. The IRS scam is the number one scam we see uh, routinely, and that is uh, the elderly person or anyone, frankly, receives a telephone call from a person identifying themselves as being with the IRS or the Treasury Department. And they proceed to inform the person that, you know, you're in serious trouble. You have unpaid taxes 
or unfiled tax return, whatever the case may be. Nonetheless, the, the gist of the scam is uh, I'm here to help you. All you need to do is give me some credit card information or personal information and we'll take care of this problem right away. That still, uh, right now anyway, is by and far the number one scam. I receive these calls daily. Uh, it's amazing how, how prolific uh, the scammers are in perpetrating the IRS scam. The second scam, and the one that really impacts older adults uh, a lot, is the grandparent scam. And the way the scam goes down is this. Um, the elderly person will receive a telephone call from a caller identifying themselves either as their grandchild or as an authority figure in a foreign country and who is informing the uh, grandparent that their grandchild is in trouble. Maybe it's they're in jail or they've, uh, they've had a medical emergency, they're in the hospital, whatever the case may be, and we need X number of dollars to clear up the problem, either pay the medical bill or, or pay the fine to get out of jail, and um, the hook gets set. And the grandparent obviously is fearful and confused and scared, and if they start uh, sending money, then the scammer will just sort of keep uh, adding on. In other words, there'll be another fee or there'll be another cost, uh, so on and so forth. And um, we had a lady here in the St. Louis, Missouri area that lost $250,000 in the grandparent scam. I mean, it was all of her retirement savings. Now, okay, one thing about the grandparent scam that has always uh, been hard for me to understand is Okay, I get it if a person is claiming to say, hey, listen, you know, I'm with the police, we have Junior in a cell here, or, but, or we're at a hospital and we have your child in the bed or whatever, but when, when they impersonate the grandchild, that seems difficult to pull off. I mean, maybe, maybe they find, why, do they, why does the, the mark not recognize that it's not the voice of their grandchild? You know that's an interesting it's an interesting question, and I think it's uh, the response is probably uh, multifaceted. Number mm -hmm. one, the calls tend to come at odd times of the day. Mm -hmm. You know, when when a person's guard is down late at night, very early in the morning. Um, number two, you know, there's that sense of urgency that the caller is transmitting in in, in their voice. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, you know, the, the idea that the scammers and what they're really trying to do is they're trying to hijack the emotions of the mark or the grandparent such that the grandparent doesn't stop and think for a split second or a few seconds and say, wait a minute, that's not my granddaughter or that's not my grandson. But the scammer just keeps piling on and piling on and building the emotion up inside the uh, grandparent so that the grandparent oftentimes acts before really thinking about it. And that ties in to our, our discussion previously about uh, social media. Again, when you post photographs of your granddaughter and put her name on it, uh, oftentimes the caller will say, Grandma, this is Emily. Uh, and Again, often for whatever reason, the senior doesn't oftentimes discriminate the voice necessarily and, and clue in that this is not my granddaughter. I understand. And with the social media, you have potentially given them all the information they need to verify, oh, well, you know, Junior was at a birthday party or this, that, or the other. And it, it seems convincing, especially in a panic type situation. Tell us a bit about this lottery thing, because as I've been doing my research, this lottery this just, <laughs> this is horrible. Yeah, yeah you know, we, we, we put the lottery in with what we uh, oftentimes call the sweepstakes scam. Yeah. And uh, my partner in Senior Scam Action Associates, Art Mains, actually has written a book based on his experiences in helping his stepfather uh, recover from the sweepstakes scam. And, and the way it goes down is uh, the caller, and again, you're probably sensing a theme. Most of the time, these are telephone contacts, or now with the internet, they're online contacts. But the caller will 
uh, call up and say, congratulations, you've won $50,000 in the Publishers Clearinghouse sweepstakes, or you've won 50000 in whatever lottery you want to pick. And we just need X number of dollars for fees or for taxes and so on and so forth. And again, in the same way as the scammer sets the hook in the grandparent scam, the scammers will set the hook in, in this kind of scam by repeatedly calling back saying, hey, we almost have the check ready, we just need a few more dollars, a few more dollars, a few more dollars. Uh, in my partner's stepfather's case, uh, he lost $70,000 before the scam was ultimately stopped. And, and again, it's, it's preying on the victim's emotion of, of greed. I mean, who doesn't like to be a winner, right? Who doesn't like the prospect of winning in a lottery or a sweepstakes? And they feel like, hey, just a, little, a few more dollars, a few more dollars, and I'll get my big check. And, of course, sadly, that check never comes. Well, one of the things that I discovered when I was doing the research for this episode is how in Jamaica there is an entire subculture devoted to this and there are gangs that fight not over drugs and guns and things of that nature they fight over lists of leads so if you get contacted by one of these scammers and then you give them the time of day well, now you're on a list that they then turn around and sell to you you are now marked not just by your immediate scammer, but now an entire network. And I guess because of the law in Jamaica, there's, the Jamaican police department is saying that our law enforcement is saying that they don't have the correct types of laws to help them combat this. But I mean, they even have rap songs down there about how prevalent this is and how it's they rationalize it away as like, well, we're not using guns. They send us the money. That's right. That's right. Uh, you, you're you're absolutely right. There's a whole network uh, of of criminals that perpetrate these kinds of scams and fraud, and they are incredibly well networked. They do share information back and forth, uh, so that if somebody falls victim to the grandparent scam, I promise you, they will be receiving a call from somebody uh, telling them they've won a prize in a sweepstakes or a lottery. Um, and so they're very well connected, very well networked. And in fact, they, I just read uh, a, a resource the other day talking about a romance scam that's actually completely automated. They have calling centers set up with people manning the phones with scripts on exactly what to say, when, and, and how to do it. I, it's it's a, almost like a business uh, uh, enterprise, uh, and they're that well organized and that well networked. So, when you say a romance thing, so is this a catfishing kind of thing? They claim that they are interested in you romantically or something. How does it yeah, work? Yeah, that you know, the, the uh, maybe a, the typical Russian bride kind of scam, um, where they reach out to a man and you know say, "Hey, I, I saw your profile on Facebook. Uh, I'm in Russia. I'd love to meet." you know, I'm single, so on and so forth, and, and and then they go from there. And I just need you to send me the money to get over there. That's exactly right. I just need the money for the plane ticket. Got it. I um, And the hotel room, and, and then, uh, you know, whatever else comes. Oh, man. Yeah. Well, you, uh, let's talk about the emotional aspect of this, because to me, that, that one of the things that really touched me about this whole thing is that our elderly as people, they're living longer, and a lot of this would not happen if they didn't have a void in their life where they felt like they wanted to talk to someone. And these scam artists, they prey upon that. You have mentioned before that the con artist is always the one who reaches out first. That's right. That's right. We, and um, that's a dead giveaway of a scam is when the, the caller is reaching out to you, advising you of, a, a problem, or B, you've won a prize. Uh, in fact, we have a motto that we, we use, and that is, never let yourself be chosen, always do the choosing. So whenever somebody is calling you and telling you that you've won a prize or you owe a, a debt, you're not doing the choosing. The caller is choosing you. 
And so that is, a, that is number one, a dead giveaway of a scam or a fraud. And there's a sense of urgency as well, because they always want you to do something very quickly. And one of the other things that I've noticed is just how sociopathic these people are in the respect that they want to get all these personal notes about you and things that you've had happened to you, maybe broken marriages or tragedies of some sort. They use that against you because they, they bond with you as any good con man does and make you believe that they're your friend and maybe they even tell you about something in their own life so you empathize now with them and they just keep this going on and on and on. And maybe you're a person who doesn't have a lot of visitors, maybe your family lives far away and you just don't have a lot going on. So now they're playing you so hard. Oh, yes. Uh, I can't tell you how many stories that I hear. Uh, and, and a common thread through those stories is these people were the nicest people in the world. Sure. They asked they ask me about my children. They asked me about my recent doctor visit. They asked me, you know, all these things, and they were concerned and kind. And you're right, you know, loneliness and isolation um, lead particularly older adults to to reach to reach for that kind of personal contact and even if it's coming from somebody that wants to do them harm they believe that it's uh, that it's out of kindness that uh, that the caller is is calling them I understand you mentioned that there are five particular traits uh, greed being one of them what are the five that 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 these scam artists use yeah, there, there are five emotional levers that scammers will use against their victims. We call them the five flags. Uh, number one is fear. Number two is loneliness. Number three is anger. Number four is greed. And then we oftentimes throw in guilt because uh, sometimes scammers will use guilt against uh, a victim. And then finally is sympathy, and that's preying on the older adult's sense of sympathy for maybe uh, an individual's plight. Maybe the scammer calls or, or reaches out to them in person and, and tells them a sad story, and they just need a few dollars to, uh, to, you know, to buy some food or whatever the case may be. But those are the main emotional levers that scammers will use against their victims. Well, tell me about anger, because I think I get all the rest of them, but how do they work the anger angle? Well, anger is, a, is an interesting uh, emotion, right? Anger really is a flip side of fear. So, uh, you know, what they'll do is they'll, they'll prey on a number of these emotions simultaneously, but right behind fear of perhaps, you know, an IRS scam where uh, the scammer says you owe X number of dollars and then finally the senior the senior victims gets angry either at themselves for missing something right or or angry at the system that they still owe taxes and owe this money so anger is is really an emotion that can play across a number of different spectrums and it's usually, in conjunction with another one of the emotional buttons that the scammer is pushing. I understand it, and maybe they want to get back at the man in some respect That's because right. they feel like they've been done wrong. That's um, right. One of the things that I was also looking into is because there may be some out there and they're, they're, they're saying to themselves, well, wait a minute, come on, in the 21st century, how do you believe the Nigerian prince is going to give you all this money or this, that, or the other thing? But what you have to understand is that I think that, I don't want to say that one generation is more cynical than the other, but the generation that we're talking about that is having all this victimhood, they, as you mentioned, some have called them the greatest generation, and they went through a lot, and they lived life in a different way. They did not have these tools that we have, and I think they looked at life in a different way, and their own character was sometimes built in a different way. and. I think they choose to try to see the good side in something to their own uh, to their own demise. That, uh, Michael, you couldn't be more more right on that point. You know, they were taught to be polite. They were taught to see the good in people, and oftentimes, all the scammer needs is an inch so that they can take that mile. Yeah. Whereas, perhaps, folks in a younger generation. 
And, and I must say, it's not just the older adults that fall victim, right? right? Younger folks do as well. But younger folks tend to be a little more cynical and willing not to give that inch. Unfortunately, uh, our older adults will give that inch, and then the scammer is very adept at playing on the emotions and making sure that the uh, victim doesn't think about what they're doing, but they're acting purely out of emotion. One of the things that I see on YouTube now is, is young people where they're, you know, they're, they're spoofing the prank caller. So, you know, <laughs> so I, I see a lot of that, but these are young people who are hip to some of the ways the world works. Your advice to a family who has a member of their family being attacked by this type of predatory action is to just don't talk to these people at all. Hang up the phone immediately. Do not try to engage them. Do not try to outsmart them. That's exactly right. Um, you know, there, there are a few people out there that, that will be able to pull that off and, and outsmart the scammer. But by and large, the safest course of action is to simply, A, not answer the phone if you don't recognize the number, or B, hang up right away if it's, uh, if it's somebody you don't know. Again, if it's somebody contacting you, you're not doing the choosing, so you're not in control. And we always advise older adults, just disconnect, terminate the contact. If it's truly important, the, the contact will, you know, recommence somewhere else. But um, the safest thing is just to hang up the phone. Because these people are practiced professionals. They are sociopaths. They're narcissists. They do not care about you. And I, right now, there's another book out on cons, and I'm going to try to get this person on as well. The book is, I think, called The Confidence Game. And, and the author was talking about how when she was interviewing scam artists, that a lot of them, you know, their, one of their favorite books was uh, Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. I mean, these are practiced people who understand the psychology of influencing and manipulating the uh, the less sharp. They, they do, absolutely. Um, they, use, they use sales psychology uh, in order to perpetrate their, their evil deeds. So uh, they're very smart folks, they're very practiced, and so don't, don't take them on. It's not worth the risk. It absolutely is not worth the risk. Uh, interestingly, uh, my partner, Art Maines, who I mentioned earlier, uh, in his book, uh, talked about a book that was found when they busted a scamming operation, and it was uh, nin uh, Mind Tricks of the Ninja or something like that. And so it was a very interesting book to be on a uh, scammer's reading list. Understood. One of, yeah. the, last, one of the last couple of things, because we're going to wrap this up in a few moments, but another thing that I discovered while doing this is that clearly as we age, our mental capacity diminishes somewhat. And, you know, some of us have dementia, which make us easy prey. But there was a study at UCLA by this woman, Sher Shelley Taylor. She's a professor of psychology at UCLA. She did a study that was funded by the National Institute for Aging, and it centered on the portion of the brain that kind of controls trust and understanding if we should be trustful or distrustful of someone. That portion of the brain is the anterior insula. It's above the amygdala. Anyway, what she found out was that when you compare the brains of the elderly with younger people, and then you show them images of things that should clearly look uh, untrustworthy, in the elderly brain, activity does not occur. And the brain changes over time. So this is not just about people not being cognizant of, of things that should send warning signs. Our brain and our brain chemistry changes over time, even if we are healthy. So there's some science behind this as well. Very true. You know, the, the area of neuroscience is, is undergoing, I think, a revolution, and there's so much great research being done. And so uh, it's interesting, the study you mentioned, that, that finds an organic reason behind a, a senior's willingness to, to be more trustworthy uh, or, or to not at least have the, uh, the red flags come up to them that there's a problem. So that's, that's fascinating. Uh, I know there's a lot of study being done kind of in the uh, behavioral finance area, uh, which shows that as we age, our level of cognitive awareness goes down just naturally. 
maybe not due to dementia or Alzheimer's or, or to any kind of brain injury or illness, but just uh, as a natural progression of aging. And then the other interesting finding that uh, we're seeing in that kind of research is that as we get older, we get overconfident in our abilities to handle financial matters and make decisions. So, again, that's another perfect storm where actually your, your cognitive ability is lessening, but your confidence is increasing, which only could lead to problems. Wow. Well, yeah. Curtis, thank you so much for coming on. We are going to place some links uh, below this video when it comes out so that people can reach out to you if you need to, if they need to speak with you. You are part of the Senior Scam Action Associates. Tell us right quickly before we go what that is and what you do. Yeah, so that's a, that is a, a venture between Art Mains and myself to educate seniors, their family caregivers, and professionals that work with seniors uh, on how to recognize and respond and recover from scams and fraud. We have uh, a blog website, we have a podcast um, that we have interesting experts on talking about various areas dealing with scams and fraud. Uh, so it, it's, it's really an educational organization and, uh, and we are truly honored to be able to do this kind of work and hopefully help people. Curtis, I appreciate you coming on. I appreciate what you do and uh, Godspeed to you, my friend. Keep doing what you're doing. Michael, thank you so much. It's been an honor to be with you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, take care of your elderly. I mean, we need to honor the older folks in our families. And in many cultures, the, we viewed them differently. So today, when we put them away or we have them in a rest home or maybe we don't reach out to them as much as we should, we need to start doing that because there's some bad folks who are preying on those types of situations. We can fix that. We can help them maintain their financial integrity by just listening and uh, showing them some love and being careful. My name is Michael Parker. As always, you, me, every single one of us, we can and we are the antidote.